Grant. Welcome to our special program honoring Juneteenth, a federal holiday that marks the end of slavery in the United States following the Civil War. Juneteenth is celebrated on June 19th because it was June 19th, 1865, when Union soldiers arrived in Galveston, Texas, announcing the end of the war and thus the end of slavery. Now you're probably wondering, why are we having an event on June 8th for something that happens on June 19th? Well, first off, we wanted to kick off our June programming honoring this event, but also the archives will be closed on June 19th in honor of Juneteenth. And so we hope that this will both educate you on what you're celebrating, also to celebrate black history in this month of June. But I also encourage you to look in your local communities because across the state, different communities, different institutions have things the weekend of and the day of. So look into your local community at what is happening to commemorate Juneteenth. Now on to the event. I am very excited to introduce you to Barbara Tagger. She has served in the National Park Service for more than 40 years. During her extensive career, she has contributed greatly to the creation and development of a wide range of national and international African-American historic sites. And she's going to tell you about some of them today. I'll say quickly, they include uh, the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historic Park, Selma to Montgomery Voting Rights March Historic Trail, Tuskegee Airmen National Historic Site, and so many more. You're going to hear about them today. She's currently serving as, a park as the park superintendent at Horseshoe Bend National Military Park. So please join me in welcoming Superintendent Barbara Tacker. Good afternoon, Can you hear me? Good. Good. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to uh, participate in the um, in your program in celebrating Juneteenth. Um, this is probably one of several in my lifetime, I think I may have participated in. And it's always a joy to speak to folks about some of the work that we're doing in the National Park Service to celebrate and commemorate African-American heritage. As it was mentioned about in my bio, <clears throat> which I can stand here for 30 minutes just talking about that alone, but I won't do that, bore you to death. I'll do that through pictures. <laughs> How about that? But um, during my 40-year uh, career, and now I can reflect back on it, it's, God, it, it's hard to say that <laughs> now. But as I reflect back on it, um, the National Park Service has contributed and preserved and interpreted a number of stories that deal with the African-American experience here in the United States and almost internationally as well, but primarily here in the United States. Um, at a time when, um, when I came into the National Park Service years and years ago, we were not doing a lot of that. Um, mainly because of the fact of the makeup of the National Park Service, the stories that they wanted to target, and the fact that um, the National Park Service had not really kind of reached out to other communities to make sure that their stories were told. I can probably speak better from an African-American perspective mainly because of the fact of, again, the amount of time that I've spent in trying to tell these stories and identifying a lot of these stories and working with the communities. And lots of times I used to always hear people say, why don't they tell our story too? And so I thought when I was asked to speak to you today in honor of um, Juneteenth, why not tell my story too? And I thought that I will give you some examples by telling you about my experience in working with the National Park Service. I've been privileged enough to work with the Park Service, like I said, for 40 years and see a lot of places, met a lot of people who were a part of the history um, in shaping this nation 
Some of them alive at the time when I came into the Park Service, some of them who were not alive, but I've got to know their descendants. I've seen a lot of places that our history books tend to live, um, leave out. We don't know about them because they are instilled or they live within our communities. And sometimes we don't pay that much attention to them. We just see them as eyesores or, or another story that an older person told me about years ago, my great grandmother or my aunt or the lady down the street or the gentleman down the street when they start reminiscing, you know, when you get to a certain age, I'm finding myself doing it now. You start reminiscing <laughs> about the past and the young people don't want to pay that much attention to it. And um, therefore, it, it falls in disrepair, it gets ignored. And before you know it, um, modern, uh, modernization has come in, tear it down, and it's gone forever. When I was going to school, uh, particularly in college, I was not taught historic preservation because it really didn't exist that much, really. Not formally. Um, I was. Um, a history major when I was in undergrad, um, in graduate school, the same, a history major, but you were not told, you were not taught to be a public historian, you were taught to be a scholar. When I came into the National Park Service in the early 1980s, I was asked by one of my professors if I would mind for the summer, go help and uh, at the Martin Luther King um, National Historic Site. Well, it was a brand new site. I was not familiar with the National Park Service. I barely knew the Martin Luther King Center for Nonviolent Social Change. I was a new um, uh, transplant uh, from St. Louis coming to Atlanta to finish my graduate work. And when she said, would you like a job um, researching, of course. That's what I was tr I'm was. i trained to do. Plus I'm a struggling graduate student. I was hungry. And so, and so she um, asked me to go down to um, apply. And fortunately the person that I had to interview with was her son. And um, I got the job as a research um, assistant. It was supposed to be a three month job. And here I am 40 years later. I never thought I would fall in love with history in the manner that I did because now I was living and breathing history. I was watching history. I grew up seeing, ooh, I'm getting old, um, Martin Luther King Jr. on television, um, the, uh, the civil rights movement as I was a youngster. And now I'm getting to know the people who actually made this history. So it was my job to make it come alive. That would continue throughout my career and it still continues throughout my career. And what I have, what you see here behind me represents all the places in the programs, in the National Historic Units and trails that I helped create in the National Park Service that I was a part of. I like to tell people when they ask me, first of all, they always ask me, what do I do? And I have to sit there and ponder. I don't, really don't know half the time because they have me doing so many different things. But for the most part, um, I spent a good deal of my career dealing with um, special resource studies in which Congress authorizes the National Park Service to evaluate a place, a person, or event to see if it's worthy of being a unit of the National Park Service. And from that point on, I was usually assigned as the historian to do the research. Ah, I got a job that pays me what I love to do. And so usually I was the one who had to wear many hats on the interdisciplinary team that was put together. And I was the one who had to mostly do a lot of the legwork, which means I had to go and see a lot of these places and meet a lot of these people. So what I'd like for you to do with me is I reminisce, now I'm being 
I guess you can say an elder in the National Park Service, travel with me down memory lane and look at some of the places and some of the uh, programs and, and trails and historic sites. These are just a sample of some of the many things that I've seen in my, in my career. Also, I wanted to tie it into Juneteenth. And one of the things that I wanted to look at is, again, what is freedom? Juneteenth represents another Independence Day as far as African Americans were concerned. When they were told, um, enslaved Africans were told in the Confederate States that they were free through the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, not all African Americans were liberated. Some who resided in the border states and also in the territories were not liberated. But the word had not spread as wide and fast as anticipated. In Texas, they had to wait another two and a half years before they heard about that they were being liberated. And it took General Granger and some of the USCTs to come and tell the 250,000 African Americans that, that who resided in Texas, you are now free. From that day on, that very day, that day became known as Juneteenth, which is now again, as I said, as far as African Americans are concerned, Independence Day. When I was putting this together, I was thinking in terms of, now how can I have my friends go down memory lane with me and do this journey and then tie in the theme of freedom, but also the whole idea of telling my story too. And as I was putting this um, presentation together, I said, well, you know what? Again, I can hear some of my um, former community partners like Ms. Wamberly and others, who would say, our story is never told. Tell my story too. So I wanted you to come on along with me, bring your cameras, get in line, and let's go down memory lane. As I mentioned earlier, let's start in Atlanta, Georgia, where I, where I was a graduate student, as I mentioned earlier, how I came to work at the National Park Service. And one of my jobs, again, there was to do the research of the neighborhood that Martin Luther King Jr. was born. This site was established in 1980, October 10th, 1980. And the role of the, of the Park Service was to tell his life story. At the time, um, his wife, Coretta Scott King, um, had petitioned to make sure that the National Park Service tells the story, interpret his story in a very professional way. And in the legislation, we were to tell his story through his ministry, his birth in his birth home, which he was born here in this home that you see um, on January 15th, 1929, in the upstairs room, second room on a Tuesday at 12 noon. He was the second of three children of Martin Luther King um, Sr. and his wife, Alberta. He also, he and his siblings were also born in that home. He also grew up in Ebenezer Baptist Church because his grandfather, his father, he and his younger brother, A.D., would serve as ministers of this church for a total of 81 years. The neighborhood which he grew up in, which is known as Sweet Auburn, which I got to know very well because of the people who helped develop that neighborhood in the times of segregation in Jim Crow era. Also, I wound up writing my master's thesis on the Atlanta race ride of 1906, which helped shape this neighborhood as well. We talked about, um, at, in, at this site, not only the neighborhood and the people, but also the residential areas. As you can see, the shotgun row houses, 
This is where I got my first introduction to historic preservation because now my job was not only just to research the neighborhood and how it impacted young ML as he was commonly known, but also how to restore it back to the years in which he lived in the neighborhood from 1929 till the age of 12 when his family moved out of this home in 1941. As we all re can remember or, or do know that he was assassinated in April 4th, 1968. And here at the King Center, this is where he's buried. And later on, his wife Coretta was buried next to him. So this completes kind of like the, his cycle of his life. But what we focused on mainly was learning, uh, was, um, learning and trying to tell people the importance and the contributions that he made in shaping America. And I love to tell stories about how many people that I have met, celebrities, um, civil rights activists who knew Martin as I was researching here. They will walk in and I'm going, oh, I knew you from somewhere. Where did I see you? And they just laugh and that's oh, in a documentary, okay. Then they'll get to talking to me about it and so forth. And um, those stories became part of my interpretation of that site. I stayed here for a good eight years or better and moved on to the next project. By this time I had moved out of, of the Martin Luther King site from downtown Atlanta into our regional office um, that is located in downtown Atlanta. I was assigned to work on the Selma to Montgomery National Historic Trail study. And again, with my background in knowing this, the history of Martin Luther King Jr., the civil rights movement, I was assigned to, to, um, to help do the research here for the Selma to Montgomery Trail. This trail study was the first of its kind at the time when I was doing this because there were no other trails National Historic Trails, that is, that were, had been um, highlighted in the National Park Service system. The trail system is like a subsidiary of the National Park Service system. And only National Historic Trails must be designated by the Congress. So as we were doing the research and working with, at the time, Congressman John Lewis, of course, many of you remember that he was a part of the Selma effort. He led the, the course of us to do this study because he felt that this was an important study for the nation to know about the importance of voting rights and how it fits well into our democratic society. We spent a couple of years working on this study, talking to a lot of the people who were actually a part of the movement. And at the time when I was doing this, many of them were still alive. And of course, I got to get to know my good friend right here, Ms. Um, Wimberly, Loretta Wimberly, at the time when she would um, take me around the neighborhood and um, talk about um, the Baptist church and, um, also uh, uh, Brown Chapel AME Church and the other churches, the role that they had. And I got to know a lot of those people. As a result of us um, doing this study, this trail was designated in the early 1990s. Um, in 1996, I believe it was. And actually it was, um, it was an exceptional case because of the fact that at the time when we were doing this study, one of the criteria was that um, a place or site must be at least 50 years old. This story was not even 30 years old at the time when we did this study. God, I'm getting old, okay. And it's now <laughs> over 50 years old. But we had to make a special case to it, uh, to the advisory team for the Secretary of the Interior to say that it meets the criteria, despite the fact it doesn't meet the one criteria of the 50 year age limit. Um, there was an exception to this case. And of course, again, once it was designated, it was the first 
and it's still the only National Historic Trail that speaks to the African American experience. So once again, it reminded me we must tell this story too. Once I moved on from Selma, I was asked by the chief historian of the National Park Service, um, Barbara, I'd like for you to work on the Underground Railroad study. Okay. <laughs> and we want you to help us do, again, be serve as the, um, as the um, historian on the team and do the research for justifying the importance of this story. My assignment at that time was to also meet the person who actually convinced Congress to look at the importance of the Underground Railroad. And the reason why I'm kind of hesitating in saying that is because the National Park Service by this time had been um, almost uh, uh, forced by the African American community to begin to start talking about slavery in the United States. As you well know, we have a number of civil rights sites that are units of the National Park Service are, or affiliated with the National Park Service. But many of them never talked about the whole idea of slavery being a part of the reason why we had the Civil War. For some reason, uh, the Park Service tried to avoid it. But at this point now, thanks to, I must say, um, I must give um, kudos to Mr. Charles Bloxon out of Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He was the one who encouraged his um, congressperson um, to present legislation in Congress to do a study on the Underground Railroad, mainly because of the fact that he traced his family heritage as part of the Underground Railroad. And once he traced his family heritage to that, he began to see all these different people that we barely knew or we thought we knew or we heard about the Underground Railroad. But because of the makeup of this story, we still didn't know. It's still a, it was a mystery to most of us. What was the Underground Railroad? And so we set out to look at the various facets of the Underground Railroad, which is represented in this slide. This is just a, a, a few of the, of, of the places in some of the stories that we found as we began to research it. We searched wide, um, nationwide, because the Park Service, I mean, well, I should say the Congress told us actually in the legislation to do a two-fold study. One, to look at sites in places that are relative to the Underground Railroad story that will be worth preserving, and also to look at it as a National Historic Landmark theme study to get um, some of these sites designated as National Historic Landmarks. NHLs outside of National Park units is the highest designation that a site can receive. Only the Secretary of the Interior can designate National Historic Landmarks. So therefore, it must go undergo a stringent type of criteria. When we went back and looked at our records and found that there were very few sites that we had listed as National Historic Landmarks, most of them did not look at from the perspective of the African American. Most of them were looked from the perspective of those who were helping them to escape. If there were African Americans identified, they were usually well-known ones like Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. But how many of you are knew of William Steele? William and Ellen Craft? Thomas Garrett? How many of you knew of Henry Box Brown or the role of the Native Americans who helped African Americans escape? What are the challenges that 
I immediately presented to the team was when I saw the legislation was, it said to start the Underground Railroad in the 1830s, 1832, because that's when the term was um, coined Underground Railroad. Well, my question was, African Americans didn't wait to 1832 to escape. <laughs> The moment that they were enslaved, many of them began to escape, and that starts in Africa as they were making their way to this portion of the world. And then we have the role, again, of the Native Americans, where how many of you ever heard of Fort Mose? That's in St. Augustine, one of the first black settlements in Spanish Florida. And they um, integrated with the Maroons, which were Seminoles, and they became known as the Black Seminoles. Seminoles meaning run away. And they set up communities there, defending Fort Mose with the Spanish because the Spanish gave them their freedom in exchange for fighting the British. This was in the 1730s. Well, let's see. You said it was supposed to start in 1830. Okay, so we were already escaping. What about the Gullah people yes. out of North Carolina, what is now North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia? Many of them were escaping out of those territories, those British territories, again, seeking refuge into Spanish Florida. Once Spanish Florida becomes part of the United States, then we can look at many of them, Seminoles, moving into Southern Florida, the Caribbean. I think I got a pointer here. Um, if you look at the map at the top in the Caribbean, also Congress told us to look at the stories in the, in the Underground Railroad operations in Canada in Mexico. We also later would find evidence that escapes took place everywhere, again, where slavery existed. We found evidence and documented escapes as far west into the territories. We went into, my colleagues and I went into Mexico and found black Seminoles and um, uh, um, the Kikapu um, community that was formed there, who helped them, um, who took in um, freedom seekers. We also went west into California before it became a state, north to the northwestern states now, which is now Washington State and Oregon, and even as far as Alaska. One of my colleagues even found evidence of six freedom seekers making their way to Hawaii. And we have evidence of that. We have evidence of some that went as far as Europe. As you well know, or probably know, that Frederick Douglass, who you see here up to the left, got, really got his freedom, even though he escaped here in America, and made his way through the, with the Underground Railroad, eventually gets his freedom in England. You may have heard of Wil, Wil, uh, Wilbur, Wilberforce, what the Wilberforce College is now named for. He was an abolitionist who helped Douglas to get his freedom. We have evidence of William Seward, who you see on the left, on the right there. You know who William Seward was? He was a senator, he was a senator and then event, eventually became the Secretary of State under Abraham Lincoln, who lived in Auburn, New York. His wife, Francine, and her sister were good friends of Sister Harriet Tubman. They all worked together. Thomas Garrett, who was a Quaker, worked hand in hand with Miss Tubman. William Steele, who himself was a freedom seeker, lived in Philadelphia. That's how he found his long lost brother. 
he was doing what? Documenting stories of those he was escaping so that he can bring their families back together. And as a result of that, he wrote the very first book on the Underground Railroad that was published in 1872. There are so many stories that I can sit here and tell you about. Uh, we looked at various aspects of the Underground Railroad, just now in houses, and no, it was not underground, and it was not a railroad. <laughs> that was the first thing that we redefined. We redefined the names of the people who were escaping. They were not fugitives, even though there were laws who deemed them as such. They were what? Freedom, seeking a freedom, no matter how much they had to sacrifice. And so we renamed them freedom seekers. No, they did not live in caves, but they also lived within urban societies in isolated areas, where we call maroon societies. We found that um, we also identified USCTs. Why them? Because some of them were freedom seekers, but also they were what? Helping to get their freedom for themselves, for their families, for their people. And they fought in the military especially during the Civil War. We had rebels like John Brown that you see here, who led um, the uh, rebellion at Harpers Ferry in the 1850s. And he was good friends with whom? Frederick Douglass, Miss Tubman. In fact, he named her General Tubman because she knew how to scout out the landscapes, which, are very, which is very important part of the Underground Railroad. Again, we found so many stories how the role of cemeteries play a role. Why would cemeteries play a role? Not because they hid people, and sometimes they did, because they were the the only way that we can document those persons. We don't have a place that we can feel in touch and visit. We don't have a place where we knew where they escaped from, but we knew their names because they would come up in time and time again in resources that we used to document them. Sometimes it was a hard burden to document but we found ways of doing it. So how do we celebrate this form of freedom? We identify them now through our logo that you will see throughout the country because it's not a park. We told Congress in the study, this cannot be a standard park because it would not do justice to this story. It would never do justice to the story. So we identify places, as you told us to do. We identify and work with the communities that celebrate the Underground Railroad through music, because music was important, a way of communication, through songs, through um, plays, um, through art, through exhibits through museums, through archives, because places like the one that we're sitting in right now helps us to do what? Document those stories, okay? And so we look at them as part of our of programs and facilities. So there are three ways that a place can now be identified as part of the, net, of the Network to Freedom program, a site, a place, a, 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 um, a um, facility, and a program. And we have now more than 700 of them located throughout this country and Canada, and we were working on 
I was working on the Bahamas before I left that program. <laughs> yeah, we had documented some escapes in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. This journey over to, then they said, Barbara, you're not working on that anymore. So, oh my God, okay. So then they, 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 they snatched me off of it. You know, whenever I came back from a trip, I never knew where my desk was going to be because they would move me from one division to another. So then they asked me, they said, Barbara, you need to work with the Tuskegee Airmen. Okay, that's fine with me, but I still got, you know, my Underground Railroad, uh, legislation still pending. I still had my similar to Montgomery uh, legislation still pending. But this was something that um, was on the fast track once we were assigned to work on this. I must say this was one of the most pleasant um, projects that I had because the men who were part of the Tuskegee Airmen was such a joy to work with because they knew exactly how they wanted their legacy to be remembered and how they wanted to be commemorated. And to sit there and listen to them talk about some of their stories, and I'm talking about some of the original pilots, not the ones that came afterwards, but the original ones that came in um, in the early 1940s. And um, to sit there and listen to them talk about the stories was fascinating. I was fortunate I had uh, to go to Washington, um, D.C. I went to school in Washington, D.C., but um, to go over to, uh, to um, um, the National Archives. And while I was there, I ran into um, a couple of the airmen who actually were bombardiers. And they were doing some research. And one of the archivists who I got to know very well introduced me to them. So we sat down, we started talking, and before I know I had all these stories they were telling me and and so forth. And it, it also, um, I found out that the person who had designed the, uh, the Moton Field Training Center at, over at Tuskegee at the time, he had just passed away and he left his, um, his uh, records and drawings um, and had his wife to donate them to Howard University, where I went to school, Howard University's um, special collections program. And so I went over to Howard University, went through the box, and we were looking for pictures that would tell us what this airfield looked like. Because at the time when I saw this was all overgrown and I would not dare go in here because I didn't know it's snakes or whatever. But uh, I'm not going in there. But we saw remnants of the buildings here. Hangar number two was not even in existence then. Hangar number one was falling down. And I had no idea of what that was looking because only the surrounding classrooms were still standing. The watchtower that you see in the background there uh, was barely standing and um, the officers club was barely standing because of the overgrowth. We had no idea what that was. Fortunately, like I said, I went through that box of, of uh, records and found original drawings and photographs. And we used that as our guide to restore this field back to its original appearance. So I have a sense of pride whenever I walk over there and say, oh, I remember I found a photograph of that, and, you know. But anyway, um, we also um, sat down with the airmen and asked them again, how would they like us to tell the story? I learned about the P-51s more than I ever wanted to know. <laughs> And, uh, because they, because the airmen taught me what what kind of aircraft that they flew, uh, and what they trained on, I think was P forty, if I remember correctly, P forty sevens and P forty nines, I believe. And um, and then of course when they um, uh, flew in um, in combat in Europe, they pretty much uh, used the Mustang, the P-51 Mustang Red Tails. So we had that recreated here as part of the aircraft that they flown, and they were well, they were known as uh, the Red Tails. That was a rush job, 
So we so we move on. The next thing I know, I was working on the Network to Freedom program because that legislation had passed. And so we were trying to get that program up and operating in the region. And so I was assigned to man manage the, um, the, uh, the Network to Freedom program, identifying sites and places in the South, which was a little bit difficult. The South and the West were the most difficult regions to document. Um, but as a part of my work that I did with the Underground Railroad study, the folks in Maryland asked for me to come and help them to see if we can um, commemorate Ms. Tubman, mainly because of the fact that in the recommendations that we did in this Underground Railroad Special Resource Study, we had a list of 14 sites that covered all um, uh, this, the, the entire spectrum of the Underground Railroad. And of course, we started with Ms. Tubman because she was known as Moses of her people. And she is readily identified with the Underground Railroad. If you said Underground Railroad and Harriet Tubman, people would know who she was. If I just said Harriet Tubman, they looked at me like I was crazy. That's the Underground Railroad. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. I know who you're talking about now. So um, I was asked to come to Maryland to work with the Maryland Park Service because they wanted to uh, designate a state park for Ms. Tubman in her honor, um, their native daughter. Um, Eventually, what we would do through the Underground Railroad study is recommend that we will work together with the state of Maryland, but also Ms. Tubman lived the remainder of her life in Auburn, New York. And so we had recommended in the Underground Railroad study to designate two sites for her, because again, her story is a very complex one, but also it helps define what freedom. When you think about her, her whole life was devoted to freeing her people. God first, then freeing her people and her family in particular. Ms. Tubman was born on, came in Cambridge, Maryland, on the eastern shore, if you ever visited there, visit there. The landscapes that are still in existence where she grew up as an enslaved um, um, young girl. She was one of nine children of Harriet and um, uh, her father's name escaped me right now. But anyway, um, she grew up on, on those landscapes, which those landscapes today still looks the same as it um, did at the time when she lived there. Ben Ross was her father's name. And she married at um, an early age in the 1840s uh, to John Tubman. That's how she got the name. Her Actually, her birth name was Armenta, and she was known as Minty. And she changed her name to Harriet after the third time she attempted to escape. With um, the first two times she attempted to escape with her brothers, but she turned back and um, came back. And her incentive of escaping was not only the conditions that she grew up in, but because her family one by one was being sold off. And she saw her two older sisters, Lina and Soph, being sold, and she never saw them again. She was afraid that she would be sold too, so that's why she attempted the third time to escape. We talk about, we named that particular site the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Historical Park, which is here, as you can see, the visitor center, because we share that visitor center with the Maryland State, Maryland State Park Service, and also it is a scenic byway the Harriet Tubman Scenic Byway, which starts in Maryland and then extends now, before I left, it was extending into Delaware and Pennsylvania. The, the goal was to extend it all the way to New York and Canada. Ms. Tubman's um, story is an international one because she lived in um, St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada for a small period of time. We worked with the Canadian government to honor her and they designated the church that she attended 
um, in the community that she founded, which is the only building that's still standing that speaks to her name. And so therefore, um, now that is a national historic site in Canada. Um, we also are looking at rest um, restoring her church, Thompson AME Zion Church in Auburn, and her grave site, which sits in the Fort Hill Cemetery across the street from the church there. She's not the only one buried in that cemetery. Uh, William Seward and his family, her two older brothers are buried there. And her second husband, Nelson Davis, who built this house for her in the 1870s. Um, um, and he's buried in that cemetery as well, but this is her grave site here. And I must add that it was really moving for me to, when I first saw her grave site, um, it became more real to me about her. But her story is a fascinating one, and it's told through these two uh, park units. Later on, um, I will be asked to, to, um, to help with the development of the, of the Birmingham Civil Rights um, site that was um, designated in 2017 as a national monument. Um, I'm gonna go this through real uh, quickly. Uh, these are some of the sites that speaks to that story, the role of churches, um, the role of that movement, particularly because of the fact that it was built around the children of the community and the role that they played in the civil rights movement. Also at the same time, another site was designated the Freedom Riders National Monument um, uh, that speaks to the, um, to the Freedom Rides of 1961. And we were, before I left there, um, until they got a, de a designated superintendent. Um, we were restoring the bus depot site, and we also were gonna restore the area around where uh, the Greyhound bus, um, bus was bombed during that, uh, during that time. Um, the Megra and Merrily uh, Evers home was recently designated, and actually today, I was supposed to be there, <laughs> but I wanted to be with you, okay? And so therefore, um, they're celebrating the 60th anniversary. Unfortunately, um, Mega Evers was um, assassinated on June 12th, um, 1963, in the very front yard of his home. And now his home is, um, death has been designated as a unit of the National Park Service. And we're working with his wife, Marilee Evers, to restore the home back to its original appearance. We're also working on, and I have been asked to set in and do consultation on a number of places and studies and, and designations for NHLs, but one of them recently just finished this study of the civil rights, um, of the Mississippi Civil Rights Special Resource Study, identifying the role of the civil rights movement in Mississippi, highlighting some of the people that played a, a pivotal role in changing America, like Fannie Lou Hamer, Emmett Till, Mega Evers, James Meredith, um, um, the. Um, the, the, the um, civil rights activists um, who led the Mississippi uh, Freedom Summer of 1964. And again, um, again, we're continuing to tell these stories as time goes on, as we meet in those 50 year marks of um, and talking about the role of the civil rights movement as they meet in those designated years, those years that we can designate them as units of the National Park Service. So I'm going to end my tour with you with that. That's enough because each one of these I can talk all day about and write a book. But I would like to open it up, if I may, to any questions that you may have about my experience. And again, how each one of these units that I introduced you to, how they meet the, the meaning of freedom as it speaks to the African-American experience and why Juneteenth means so much to not only the African-American community, but to everyone in this country.
being with us today, but also thank you for all of your amazing work and uh, what we've learned today. Uh, we do have time for questions and... Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'll take Also, if you are online, we will be able to hear your questions. You just need um, to submit in the comments. I'll get it on my phone. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you so very much. Um, that was just incredible for me. Um, I, I just have a question about the, two questions. One is about the Anderson. Is that Anderson's bus? Yes. Uh -huh. and, is it, are they doing something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We restoring the Greyhound bus station back to its original. Mm -hmm. The bus station is um, back to its original appearance. The bus. Uh, this particular bus. Uh, I don't. I don't know if they ever did. But did that, that, this bus was burned. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Well, you know, I mean, it's the state that it's in now because that. A replica they have in the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. Yeah, you know that that was a replica. Of it. Yeah. Also, you know, our, the Montgomery bus boycott bus is in uh, uh, Ford Museum. Yes, I have seen and that one. Mm -hmm. They said that is the original bus. Yes, and, uh -huh. and we have a replica of that bus here in Montgomery. Yeah. But the second thing is, where exactly is the Harriet Tubman Museum? That's what I've been trying to. Which one? There's so many. Of okay, them. That, that's that's <laughs> I think that's why I was confused because I when I pulled up the site, it was like more than one site. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's so many. Many of them are named in her honor because there's one in Macon, Georgia, but um, there's name in her honor, but she never was in Georgia. And a lot of people you, you were ask me, did she ever come to Georgia? I said, no, she never came to Georgia. As far as we know, as far south as she came, we know she came to South Carolina, Buford, because of um, during the, the Civil War. And um, she came and freed at least about 700 people in the plantations when the when the um, Union forces came into um, Buford during that time. And actually, she lived there for quite a while because um, there were people who actually lived in the community was telling me stories that were passed down to them that she, of course, she was a washerwoman and she trained some of the women in the community as washerwomen to, so they can earn money. They were jealous of her when she first came there. And, um, and so when she recognized that, she said, well, you know, let me show you how I'm doing it. Okay. But really she came there as a scout. She didn't come there as a washerwoman. She came there as a scout. So like I said, she had a very complicated life and a very complex life, but a fascinating one. In Auburn, New York, that I showed you there. That's where I would start. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's in Auburn, New York, uh, in the Fort Hill um, Cemetery, okay, um, which is located across the street. Again, she was um, a member of the Amy Zion Church. And um, before they um, start renovating the church, um, her great, great, grandniece showed me where she would um, sit on the pew. She sang in the choir. She was a devout uh, religious person. And um, there's stories behind that, but I won't get into because I can talk about Miss Tubman all day. <laughs> but uh, I, I just uh, um, adored her before I started on that. And I adore her even more. And just the respect um, I had for this petite woman who could not read and write and what she did with her life is just amazing. Mm -hmm. She was an amazing woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Did Harry Tubman go back to help her sister escape and her sister would not leave? And, but she let her daughter, daughter parent. Mm, not quite. So, uh, not, yeah, no, just no. Quickly, um, so for our, our online audience, so they, they can hear, the question was um, about uh, Harriet Tubman's sister and whether or not she was able to go back for her or whether she refused. Right. Um, no, um, her sister, Rachel, is the, after she got her freedom the first time, she actually came back to get her husband, John. John Tubman was a freeman, and um, he um, had married after she came back. And so when she discovered that, she decided that she would go ahead and um, rescue her sister, but her sister had died. And her, her niece, her sister's daughter, was about to be sold. And so she plotted the rescue of her niece, Kasaya. 
And so that was her first rescue. Each time Ms. Tubman came back to, um, to Cambridge, uh, the Eastern Shore where she grew up, she was coming back to get family members. That was first and foremost. And anyone else who wanted to come with her was, glad, was, was welcome to come. But it was always her family. Mm -hmm. But it was her sister, Rachel. And her sister um, was, um, had died before she could rescue her. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Of course. We don't hear a lot about uh, a museum or recognition of uh, Miss Fannie Lou Hamer. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Is that there somewhere that they're doing something uh, for Fannie Lou Hamer? Well, not for her specifically. What we um, found, because we don't have anything, you know, physically still intact for her. I wish it was, because believe me, I would love to work on that project too. Um, I had the same admiration for Miss Hamer as I did with for Miss Tubman, but. Um, but we're gonna, because of her work, her body of work, um, she is grouped in with a number of the of the of the um, the civil rights activists who played a pivotal role in the movement in Mississippi. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, thank you again. So you can please join me in thanking Superintendent. Clark. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And thank all of you for attending. I hope to see you again next week for Food for Thought. Uh, that'll be next Thursday, June 15th at noon here in the Farley, or you can join us online on Facebook and YouTube to hear Dr. Megan Sullivan talk about Invisible No More, Alabama's LGBTQ plus history. Thank y'all. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. We gotta get our picture together.